our sponsor, the Harbor Side Inn. Dr. Zabin is a professor of history and director of the American Studies program at Carleton College, where she teaches courses on 17th and 18th century America, especially the American Revolution. She has authored two books, Dangerous Economics, Status and Commerce in Imperial New York, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2009, and The New York Conspiracy Trials of 1741, Daniel Horstmanden's Journal of the Proceedings with Related Documents, which Bedford Books published in 2004. Additionally, she is the co-designer of the forthcoming video game series about the Boston Ma Massacre, Witness to the Revolution. Her work in the Boston Massacre has garnered her major financial support, including funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, TWICE, and the American Council of Learned Society. Please join me in welcoming Serena Zane. Good Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and I thank you in many ways, which is to say, both for um, your bravery here, which we do deeply appreciate, but also coming out um, to think about history together, which is a fabulous thing to do. Um, oh, I actually want to point out, I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm going to read a little bit, and it occurs to me that I should have my own text. So. I've been doing this, but I haven't actually memorized the passages that I was trying to read to you. Um, so um, thank you, and thank you to Newport Historical Society, and it is a thrill to speak in this beautiful room. It's really gorgeous. Thank you for having me. Um, so as I said, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to read a little bit um, so that you can see in the end why I call the Boston Massacre a family history. So um, many of you I know are interested in history as um, through, through people, right? As, as performance, through reenactment, through speaking, um, through tours, I know. Um, and so I think that that's one of the most important pieces of doing history that some professional historians um, lean to the side more than we ought to. Um, sometimes we get a little obsessed with questions of um, why and wherefore, and we forget some of the people. So I want to spend some time starting, I think, with history as story. Um, and I, um, so, should start with a little scene setting. Um, so we are now um, 250 years and one week past the um, events that I'm going to talk about, so the Boston Massacre, uh, which I will explain momentarily, but March 5th, 1770. Um, if you, we have to bring ourselves, what, um, 45 miles, something like that? Um, to um, to Boston. Boston uh, in 1770, a um, few things, is a town, not a city. I think that's worth remembering. It's small. It's only about a square mile. And it's a peninsula, right? There's not, um, there's all that landfill that we now understand to bring us to, you know, Dorchester and Charleston. Those places are, don't yet exist. Um, so it is a small, Town March in 1770, in the years before global warming, there was snow on the ground, um, some of which had actually, in fact, melted a little bit, but then refrozen. So it's a lovely March ice with some fresh snow on top of it. Um, and it is dark. I think that's the only thing that's really important to remember. There are no street lights yet in Boston. Street lights will come in. 1774, but before then, there's there's no lights. So um, we have to imagine a very dark city. It's a town, excuse me, um, and small, snowy, a little cold, but not freezing, um, and it's a little slushy. And so we have to start here, I think, with a story um, that many of us know, but I think we need to unlearn. It's a story that um, comes to be known as the Boston Massacre. So these are just maybe five basic facts that I think all of the contradictory evidence from that night actually agree. 
which is this. Okay, right in front of what is now the old state house, what was then called the townhouse, um, but a kitty corner to it, was another house, a private house, that was being rented by customs officials, people who were in charge of importing um, and import taxes, um, that they turned into their offices. And there's a sentry, uh, um, a, a red-coated sentry who is in front of it. It's about 9 o'clock at night, 8.30. Um, and a group of Bostonians come by and start hassling him. Um, how many is really kind of a question. Um, what the hassling was is also kind of up to um, some interpretation. But the sentry gets anxious, calls for backup. The backup comes in the form of a handful of um, privates, a corporal, and a captain. Right? They come. The captain orders the Bostonians, which now range anywhere in estimates from 15 to 100. So you can see how random it would be, right? Like, what are we, 20 people or so in this room? Okay. So some group, absolutely some group, but could be anything, um, orders the civilians to disperse. They don't go. There's some shouting. At some point, someone yells, fire. That term that could have come from either um, a, um, a rumor, which certainly was going around, that the town of Boston was on fire. At some point, the bells Church bells begin to ring, which is part of the fire alarm. There are Bostonians on the street with their leather buckets ready for the fire brigade. So maybe someone's yelling something about fire. Maybe um, Bostonians are yelling at the soldiers, you don't dare fire. I dare you to fire, but you don't dare to. Maybe someone gave a command to fire. We actually don't know. Okay? But at some point, someone fires. And when the smoke clears, there are... Three Bostonians dead, fourth almost dead, and a fifth dying of his wounds. Okay, and another eleven are injured, actually. Um, and that is the event that comes to be known as the Boston Massacre. Okay, so just have that piece in your mind. Um, <coughs> we know this story very largely from um, this very, very famous engraving. I probably um, the most famous 18th century image there is from North America. Here what we see are hapless Bostonians who are being mowed down by a phalanx of disciplined soldiers, urged on by their captains and sword. There's a lot of gore, of course, I hope you can all notice the gore. There's one woman with her hands to her breasts right in the middle, and her presence is a little hint to the viewer that she's surrounded by a group of respectable Bostonians, right? Not a group of hooligans. And of course, the dog, everyone loves the dog. The dog is the symbol of loyalty, who is here, I think, looking very lost. So the picture is clearly meant to be propaganda. I think we all learned that around fourth grade, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, just for one example, you know, the customs house is renamed here Butcher's Hall, right? Not a subtle term. Um, it's obvious that this is an image that's meant to blame the army. Okay, those are the people who are at fault here. Um, if somehow the viewer misses this in the picture, I'm going to try to read to you in all of its florid glory part of the poem on the bottom because it's just so incredible. I don't know if I'm going to do it justice, but I'm going to try. And I should say, some of this is meant to be amusing. You should feel free to find this one. But this poem is unbelievable. Okay. Unhappy Boston, see thy sons deplore thy hallowed walks be smeared with guiltless gore, while faithless Preston and his savage bands with murderous rancor stretch their bloody hands, like fierce barbarians grinning over their prey, approve the carnage and enjoy the day. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this image is not subtle. It's not meant to be subtle. Okay, it's meant to be very, very clear. And therefore, as we look at it now in the 21st century, it's pretty easy to dismiss it as propaganda. Okay, it's pretty easy actually to miss a different piece of the bias because the obvious part is so clear to us. Because there's a different part of Revere's story here that we have to unlearn. And I think it's so obvious that we don't see it anymore. It's what I might call the story of the two sides. So if you look, the very center of this image is a thick white 
cloud line of gun smoke. And visually, this line separates the row of disciplined red-coated soldiers from the crowd of terrified civilians that they're slaughtering. The smoke marks the split between inhabitants on the one side and civilians on the other, uh, sorry, and soldiers on the other. And this picture of two opposing sides, American and British, has always seemed so obvious that no historian has ever thought, or really almost anyone else, to question this story, this part of Robert's telling. But the truth of the matter is that civilians and soldiers were not on opposite sides of the street at all, neither actually nor figuratively. And once we stop letting Robert tell us what we can see, once we start seeing all of Boston, not just the little bit that Revere shows us here, there's a whole different part of Boston, side of Boston, that's lying there in plain sight. So to get to this different story, I want to back up, both to the beginning of my book and really to a different beginning altogether. So here I'm just going to read a little from the beginning of chapter one. June 7th, 1765. A young Irish woman made her way through the crowded streets of Cork to the harbor. Following the red coat of her husband to the dock, Jane Chambers approached a man in uniform and gave him her name. To her relief, he let her pass. The name of her husband, Matthew, had also been checked off the list, but the uniformed man did not bother to note the name of the couple's child. At last, after weeks of waiting, Jane and Matthew Chambers, along with their child, boarded the HMS Thunderer, where they joined Matthew's mates in the British Army's 29th Regiment of Foot. Three days later, they set sail for America. It may seem strange to begin an account of the Boston Massacre with a woman in Ireland, yet she and women like her are the threads that tie together the range of people and the complexity of the forces that led to that dramatic moment. The complete story of the death of Bostonians at the hands of British troops is more than the political upheaval that followed the shooting. It is also the story of personal connections between men and women, civilians and soldiers. Over time, the women and children associated with the 18th century British Army have been forgotten. In the American imagination, most of the men, too, have been reduced to anonymous troops rather than considered as individuals. Jane Chambers was not and is not famous. Her early life is lost to historians. We know neither when she was born nor in what year she married. Could she read or write? Was Matthew Chambers her first love? Had she ever dreamed of a life beyond Ireland? The sources are silent on these questions. But other parts of her life, including the choices she made, the family she created, and the voyages she took, have left traces. The everyday life of an ordinary woman would become part of an extraordinary moment. So when Jean and Matthew Chambers are boarding that troop ship, they're part of a peacetime deployment. So for those of you for whom, you know, the middle of the 18th century is not really fresh in your mind, and I know for some of you it is, um, let me just remind you really briefly. Two years earlier, 1763, Britain had won the Seven Years' War. In North America, that war had been fought primarily against the French and their native allies. As a result, the French withdrew all of their claims to eastern North America, including most of the area we now know as Canada. Their native allies, unsurprisingly, did not cede their land. So now, the British Crown had to figure out how to manage their new empire, including conflicts with these former allies of the French, and how to pay for the war. And among the many policies that the British Parliament pursued after 1763, were several schemes to centralize the administration of the British Empire and to raise money on imported goods. Um, and these measures were unpopular, to put it mildly. So in Boston, there are riots against both the customs duties and those who are supposed to collect them, the customs officials. So in 1768, after a particularly enormous protest, the Massachusetts governor decided that he needed backup 
he decides then to do this, that what he really needs are troops. He wants to have troops to help keep order in Boston. So to understand why he would make that decision, there's three things you need to know about the 18th century British Army. Okay? First, the whole idea that there should even be an army in peacetime, what was known as a standing army, seemed wrong to most Britons. The general idea was that a government really shouldn't have an army that it could just turn on its citizens. In fact, Britain did have a peacetime force, had had one through all of the 18th century, though everyone was very clear that it was subject to civilian authority. And that brings me to my second point. Governors and magistrates often asked the war office to send them troops to use as a police force. This was as true in England as it was in the colonies. There is no police in the 18th century, right? All over England, smugglers attempted to evade import taxes, and local magistrates tried to catch them at it. In fact, that same year that the Massachusetts governor asked for troops, so in 1768, the man who's in charge of distributing these troops around the peacetime empire, who's known as the um, quartermaster general, he complains that so many magistrates had asked for regiments to support customs officials and to suppress riots all over England that he was running out of regiments to hand out. Okay? It's really common. So no one is singling out Boston at this particular moment for particularly unruly behavior. And then there's the third thing that you really need to know um, about, about the 18th century British Army. We often think of 18th century armies as parallel to contemporary ones in everything maybe but the equipment. But they're significantly different because 18th century armies traveled with women and children. Okay? Hundreds of military families flooded into Boston in 1768 and their presence in the town had an enormous impact on future events. So, when these first two regiments, and you know the bit of a sailed into Boston Harbor in the fall of 1768, the governor and his council were still squabbling about where the troops were going to be quartered. Okay? What we see here is Revere protesting the march of these troops right down the Long Wharf. So those of you who know Boston, that's right where the aquarium is, right? Um, marching right down to what's now the old state house. Uh, into the heart of Boston. You can see all of those spires reminding us what a God-fearing place Boston is. Um, and um, this is a protest about what happens when <coughs> troops come to a town. Okay? Um, but in fact, the story, not surprisingly, is more complicated than this. When, um, when the selectmen of Boston hear that troops were coming, they say, well, if they're really going to come, they're not happy about this. They should stay out in Boston Harbor. I'm hoping that this next one. Okay, there's Boston Harbor. Okay? Um, they should stay out in Boston Harbor. A few years earlier, during the Seven Years' War, Massachusetts had refurbished its um, barracks that are out there on what's now Castle Island, no longer a castle, uh, no longer an island, it's still a castle actually, right? Um, but um, they, they thought they were pretty nice. They had raised a lot of money to you know, fix them up, and they said, well, this is where the troops should go. The quartering after the 18th century was very clear. If there are available barracks, troops must go into the barracks first. If there's not sufficient room in the barracks, or there are not sufficient barracks, then they can be quartered in public houses, right? That's why they're public. Of course, that's what we now know as pubs and bars, and there's great reasons why officers were not thrilled about putting troops into bars, but that was what they were supposed to do. And only then, only if there's not barracks and there are not sufficient public houses, could the army requisition private homes. Okay? Um, and they, so, so Slotman said there's no, you have no chance whatsoever of putting these troops in public, in private homes. Right? But when the governor and the commanding officer looked at this map, I'm like, listen, it's a three mile row from Castle Island into the heart of Boston, or seven miles to tramp around, including kind of waiting, um, to get in if you're going to go by foot. This is not the kind of police work we have in mind. 
So if you want to think about what Boston looked like, here's Boston in um, 1769. That's what this map is of. Um, and you can see it's quite narrow. You can see that harbor really does dominate it. Um, and for those of you interested, this is what the modern map looks like on top of it. Okay, so you can see how much of it's been filled in since then. Um, but it's quite small. Um, and what the governor really wanted was to be able to put the troops right in the heart of Boston, right in the middle, right in front of the old state house, right, um, where he would easily be able to call on them in any kind of crowded situation, right, to put down a riot um, and to help those customs officials as they're trying to do their business right in the middle of Boston. Okay, this is his dream. Like, Right. Um, it's not going to work that way. And in fact, they're very clear. If you try right, to put um, soldiers in private homes, we will have you cashiered. Okay? Um, this ends up being a fight about whether Boston Harbor is part of Boston. And the selectmen say it absolutely is. You liked it fine when you put troops there during the war. right? So it still is. So the compromise that the army comes up with in, and it's really significant, surprisingly significant, is to rent spaces from Bostonians. Okay? So they don't requisition private homes. They end up instead renting. They rent people's extra houses. There's not a lot of those. But then they end up renting people's um, spare rooms, and they rent their sheds, and they rent their basements, right? Whatever they have, people are renting out space to the army. Um, it's worth saying, just because I, this will come up in a bit, it takes a few weeks for them to come to this compromise. Meanwhile, Jane Chambers and her kids are like camping in the middle of Boston Common. It's not pleasant, but they, um, they finally come up with it. And so this map indicates um, where troops end up living. The blue squares are warehouses that the army manages to rent that they use as you know small barracks, right? Where you can put clusters of people. And the red dots are um, a very small percentage of where people are living. But these are ones that actually I have a very high degree of confidence are correct. Okay? Um, so ones that we can know for a fact are private homes that soldiers and their families are living in. And if you look at this, you can see they are not in some little green zone, right, in the middle of Boston. They are scattered through the entire mile, right? They're throughout the entire town. And that makes a big difference because the troops and the townspeople find themselves living literally together. They turn Bostonians into landlords and landladies, okay? Um, and you can imagine when 2,000 members of the army, plus another five to 700 women and children, move into a town that's only 16,000 residents in total, they sometimes find each other a little annoying, right? They're living cheek by jowl. Men like Revere, think about those images, who are part of the Sons of Liberty or other political groups, definitely saw the presence of troops as a military occupation. So the clerk of the town meeting starts complaining, oh, Boston has become a garrison town. He and the other men walking through Boston at night were really annoyed that they get stopped by patrols and that's their business. And the constables who make up the night watch actually find themselves the brunt of some pretty abusive language by a lot of drunken officers. Um, and they're unhappy. And that's what we've tended to know about. But their complaints should not be the only way that we think about troops in Boston. So instead, I'd like us to think about a very different place when you hear that term, garrison town. So I want everyone just to take a moment to call to mind Maryton in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Okay? So think of the excitement that having a regiment quartered a few miles away created for that family of the unborn. Fathers might be anxious, but young women were delighted. So think of Lydia Bennett imagining herself at a regimental encampment like this one, um, and I just have to read the Austin because it's so fabulous. She saw all the glories of the camp, its tents stretched forth in beauteous uniformity of lines, crowded with the young and the gay, and dazzling with scarlet, and to complete the view, she saw herself seated beneath a tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers in it. <laughs> 
Lydia is really something, right? But the soldiers that beguiled those young women of Meryton during the Napoleonic Wars were really not so different from these red-coated men who end up catching the eye of Boston's young women in the years before the American Revolution. So Pride and Prejudice can help us understand what it meant to families and neighborhoods when a regiment was quartered nearby. The arrival of all of these men, many of them young and single, all of them with a steady, if small, income, could not help but attract the attention of young women. But so many young men frequenting taverns, strolling the streets, dropping by a neighbor's kitchen, an unmarried woman might well be able to find a husband, possibly one even living in her family's spare room. I mean, who thought that doing laundry could be so fun? <laughs> like Lydia's father, Mr. Bennett, some men found it impossible to control their female dependents in the face of so many red coats. So let me read to you one of my favorite stories because I think it will give you a little flavor of what it was like to live in Boston during these years. And also because I gotta say it's just totally fabulous. Um, it was great. All right. So this is from. This is from the beginning of chapter 5, which is called Love Your Neighbor. While his comrades in the 29th Regiment were camping on the Boston Common or meeting their new neighbors, Private William Clark was spending his time with literature, his own. Two months after his arrival in Boston, Clark announced in his play, The Miser, or The Soldier's Humor, a comedy in three acts, was available for purchase by subscription. The broadside announcing the subscription included a brief and nearly correct Latin tag, non posum placato omnibus. I can't please everyone. <laughs> Presumably, Clark acquired enough subscriptions to publish his play, since the following February, the printer Ezekiel Russell advertised in all the Boston papers that he had just published The Miser and would sell it for, with a blue paper cover for eight pence. Sadly, no copies remain for us to read today. Russell may not have printed many. The short run was likely read until it fell apart, and then, like many cheaply printed pamphlets, were used as toilet paper. Such a fate might have been particularly appealing to some Bostonians. In the winter of 1769, not too many residents were likely eager to read about the soldier's humor. Private William Clark seemed to have a flair for drama off the page as well. In May 1769, he had a shouting match with the Boston Watch. When stopped on the street, he threatened to burn down the town workhouse and all of Boston with it. As the watchman arrested him and brought him to a local lockup, Clark swore he'd have his revenge on the entire town. It took Clark only a month to stage an even more melodramatic scene with Boston locals. One June day in 1769, 75-year-old Joseph Lazenby was shocked upon entering his married daughter's house to find Clark in bed with his 20-year-old granddaughter, Mary Nell. The elderly son of Liberty ordered Clark out of the house, but the insouciant soldier declined to leave. He had every right to sleep with Mary, Clark asserted. After all, she was his wife, he told the astonished old man, and he was going nowhere without her. Clark may have been stretching the truth a bit. Mary said they had been married one evening by a person who was dressed as a priest. <laughs> in fact, they were not married until four months after being caught in flagrante. But married they were, much to the distress of Mary's parents. So devastated were they, the Boston Evening Post claimed, that the news of the affair much impaired their health. Two weeks after the marriage, Mary's father had a showdown with his new son-in-law. Clark shoved a loaded pistol into Joseph Nowell's chest. Joseph pressed charges, and after many adjournments, in April 1770, Clark found himself in jail until he could pay a 40 shilling fine. Now, William Clark's marriage meant more than a family scandal. It became political fodder for Boston Sons of Liberty. In fact, the story of Joseph Lazenby finding Clark in his granddaughter's bed was reported in newspapers sympathetic to the Liberty Party. Not into a sense of propriety, especially about sexual matters, the press usually replaced many personal names in its stories with dashes, 
But Bostonians obviously knew something of Clark's story before it was printed. So when the shopkeeper, Harbottle Door, read the account in the Boston Evening Post, he carefully annotated the article, recording that the young woman in question was Mary Nowell and her grandfather, Mr. Lazenby. Boston's newspapers rarely printed accounts of sexual scandal for their salacious details alone. Such earthy stories were much more likely to show up in fiction or in dog roll, like I read to you. The Journal of the Times used the story to point out the political implications of this illicit marriage, urging its readers to reflect on the inevitable impact of troops on Boston's families, that the most dear and tender connections must be broken and violated. The ultimate blame for this seduction, the article concluded, must fall on those imperial officials who have been the authors of these scenes of public and private distress. The old man stumbling in on his favorite granddaughter was only the preface to the primary protest, the quartering of a standing army in times of peace. The author argued that in the world of occupied Boston, public and private affairs of the heart were one and the same. Now, it seems unlikely that Clark had thought of his seduction in terms of politics, he spent his time in prison imagining his next literary work. In August 1770, he took out another advertisement, this one for his new memoir, a true and faithful narrative of the love intrigues of the author William Clark, a soldier in His Majesty's 29th Regiment of Foot. And actually, this is only the beginning of an extensive title. Clark's love intrigues exposed an 18th century soap opera, complete with cameo appearances by various Sons of Liberty and British Army officers, in settings ranging from prisons to bedrooms. He clearly meant his 60-page narrative to be a tell-all, and perhaps also a means of revenge targeting his in-laws. Unlike the journal and other newspapers, Clark named names. The long title of his memoir concludes with these words, in which is given a faithful account of his courtship, marriage, and bedding with Mary Nowell, daughter of Joseph Nowell, boat builder at North End Boston. I mean, that's what you do when you have a phone book. And a description of how much he suffered on said account. The memoir has not survived, so we can only imagine how Clark might have told his version of being found in bed by his lover's grandfather. We can assume from the title and from its emphasis on Clark's suffering that his version would depart from the narrative in the Sons of Liberty's journal. The villain of Clark's story is his father-in-law, called out by name. This flippant young man was not troubled by the politics of the British Empire and its impact on his wife's family or hometown. Instead, this was the age-old story of young lovers and disapproving parents. So, you know, what we get from this besides the fact that Clark is kind of a fabulous rake, I think, is that he is one of many, many couples, part of many couples, um, who become part of Boston in those years. So he does so in a way that's perhaps more dramatic than lots of other people, but um, in the years that there are um, troops in Boston, local civilians and soldiers make families together. They make actual, real families. They marry, they have children, sometimes they have children without marrying. Um, they make fictive families together in which when military families have children and bring them to the local churches to be baptized, they ask locals, they ask civilians to act as godparents, okay? Um, so they make families together in Boston and they also sometimes became parts of families and communities outside of Boston as well. Um, but I just want to talk about one piece of my research that really surprised me, actually, about the ways in which locals and soldiers came together, and that was desertion. So desertion is actually a, a surprising place to look for a family history, it seemed to me, right? Um, but I, as I worked through the sources, I just found particularly surprising the rates at which men, um, and here almost entirely single men, deserted from the army. They deserted at something more than three times the rate that men usually deserted from the British Army in the 18th century. So during the Seven Years' War, for example, when the British Army is in North America, 
they lost about 3% of their force every year to desertion. In the first year and a half that the 29th Regiment was in Boston, they lost a full 10% of their men. Okay? These men were not just fleeing the unpleasantness of Army life, nor were they just drawn to the beauty of New England. <laughs> They made new homes, and when the army tried to come and take back deserters, their, command, their communities often turned out to support them. The commanding officers were clearly deeply frustrated by this rate of desertion, and at one point, the colonel decides he's going to hire a spy to ride around Massachusetts and New Hampshire and look for deserters. And he's successful in finding them. He's not very good at getting them to come back, largely because they put down roots. Um, and that's even when the Army's offering various amnesties for them to come back. So just for one story, north of here, just over the New Hampshire border, the informer finds a man, um, he calls a likely man, which in 18th century parlance is often you know, a kind of good-looking guy, right, strapping, um, who having lived there all winter was now married to his landlady's daughter, literally, and starting a family. He was easily recognizable, the informer continued, because he frequently wears his regimental jacket to do the farm work. He continued to wear his jacket. He never returned to the army. He had a son, he stayed in New Hampshire, uh, and he made a life there. So the desertion stories, too, just like the marriages and other pieces, show us that soldiers and civilians were much more closely intertwined than we realize, than were the implies to us. So to bring us back to March 5th, 1770. When Bostonians and soldiers mingled on the streets, they knew each other, often well. Right? They didn't always like each other, but when that century calls for backup and that backup comes, all of them knew at least some of the Bostonians on the street that night. Right? Um, one of the soldiers who comes um, is a man named James Hardigan, who actually had recently married a Boston woman. Another is a man named Edward Montgomery, whose wife, Irish wife Isabella, had come with Jane um, on that on the HMS uh, Thunderer, come to Boston 17 months earlier. Um, Isabella was a woman who did not get along particularly well with her neighbors earlier that night. Um, she apparently shouted loudly enough for people in the surrounding houses to hear that the town was too haughty and too proud, and many of their asses would be laid low by morning. The Bostonian Susanna Cathcart, tired of both Isabella and her husband, shot back, I hope your husband will be killed. But not all Bostonians wished death, even on the Montgomerys, okay? Because often on the street that night was a carpenter named Thomas Wilkinson. For a few months, the Montgomerys had rented a house near Wilkinson, and they become friendly. And in the 18th century equivalent of running to a neighbor's house for a cup of sugar, Wilkinson occasionally sent his kids to Montgomery's house for some coal when his own fire had gone out. So when Wilkinson saw Montgomery marching out to support the century, he walked straight over to his former neighbor to ask what was happening. Of course, what was happening on the night of March 5th, 1770 is the big question. Right? Remember, there's only a few points on which all these eyewitness accounts agree. Um, which, you know, I'll remind you, right? These men come, someone yells fire, there's somebody fires, people are dying and dead. Okay? That's what we know. But we also know now that when people looked around, they knew the soldiers and the civilians on the street. At the time, that event was shocking. I mean, I think it's hard for us to even imagine how shocking it was to see Bostonians bleeding out in the street in front of the seat of governmental power. I think it's like it's like seeing, imagining seeing people bleeding to death in front of the Capitol. That's what it felt like. Okay? It's a big deal. But, and this is a big but, absolutely no one thought that this was the beginning of a revolution. Boston women continued to marry British soldiers. Famously, John Adams agreed to take on the defense of the soldiers from the captain, and of course, two juries of Massachusetts men acquitted most of the soldiers. The importance of March 5th, 1770 is not the shooting itself, 
but how that shooting became transformed into the Boston Massacre. Both those people who supported the governor and those who opposed him scrambled to tell their version of the story. Both sides want to claim innocence, right? They want to put the blame somewhere else, and they did this through pamphlets. You can see some competing pamphlets that come out, um, through images, like, you know, this one, as I've said. Most of all, through the trial of the soldiers and their captain. What all of these did in the same way was to erase women and children and neighbors from the story. We've already seen it with Revere. We see it in the trials, which deliberately ignore any connections between civilians and soldiers. And both sides found it necessary to ignore the family history of the Boston Massacre. Just sort of remember, after the shooting, troops were redeployed, some of them within a couple of months, and the other regiment a couple of years later. When the soldiers leave, families are ripped apart. They're faced with choices, right? These families that have now become blended families of civilians and soldiers. Um, men can desert, as they do, to stay with their family, with their new families. Um, women may choose to stay, not to abandon their native homes, their parents, their siblings. They self-divorce, we call that. Divorce itself is very expensive. They self-divorce. They eventually do remarry, but it's difficult. We find many of them with children in the almshouse for a few years after that. Um, or women decide that they're going to throw their lot in with their new husbands and their husbands' communities, and they leave. And we have to see that there are shards of Boston, right, that are embedded now in the British Army as it travels around the British Empire. Okay? They're separate, but they go. This ripping apart of families is the most significant impact, I think, of the Boston Massacre. So let me just conclude with a couple of paragraphs from my conclusion. We inherit the story of the American Revolution from a far wider range of people and a far more complicated set of connections than we ever acknowledge. Those who call the American Revolution a civil war portray the conflict as a clash of citizens, a struggle over the de definition of a new country. But it would be no less accurate to call the revolution a sibling war. It played out in the upheaval of innumerable families formed and split by the same military occupation. Every family wrestled with that conflict in its own way, and every family was forced to make choices as difficult as they were inevitable. War, peacekeeping, and political administration brought together civilians and soldiers, men and women, children and godparents throughout the British Empire. Those same forces buffeted families and sometimes tore them apart as they moved around the Atlantic Rim. In an 18th century Anglo-American world in which family and government were closely connected notions, the shooting in Boston marked not the beginning of the American Revolution, but the breakdown of a family. Prior to 1772, the language of family had long saturated British political discourse. But in the context of military families, it took on new and personal meanings. We think of the American Revolution as a political event, but it was much more like a bad divorce. This family history reminds us of the human bonds, as well as the political ones, that were broken at the beginning of the American Revolution. Thank you.
but like a first, my first year seminar, which was called Trials in Early America, um, and um, it was it was not about the Boston Massacre. I, I constructed it to work on a different set of trials I was interested in. But um, at some point, I learned that one of those pamphlets that I showed, um, the short narrative, um, Carleton College owned in their special collections an original one, which is surprising given that it's in Minnesota. And I would bring my student, they bought it in the 1930s for cheap, when this stuff was going for cheap. And I, would br I brought my students to look at it, and for a few years we looked at it, before I really read it. And when I really like read it with attention, the very, very first deposition in there is from a Bostonian who says, oh, you know, there are soldiers making threats. This was a premeditated attack, right? That's what the story usually is um, that said. And so, and everybody read this pamphlet for the threats. And he said, yes, I heard these threats. I was in my neighbor's house and the soldier's wife made this threat. And it took me years to read this before I said, Soldiers have wives? I, I didn't even know soldiers had wives. Like, you know, who is this woman? Why is she in a Bostonian's house? What is happening here? Right? And um, and so it was sort of that moment that I thought, I don't know anything about this. It really surprised me. And then the first, the very first day I was in the Boston Archives when I went to check it out the following summer, I found two, I mean possibly three, of the marriages between soldiers and civilians in the Trinity Church records. And they were just lying there. And I thought, oh my gosh, like this is not a story that is complicated to tell. It's just there. We just hadn't seen it before. But I felt like maybe that was a little too um, apropos <laughs> <laughs> if I chose not to. But in fact, they come, um, and it's hard for them. They have some more children. They have another child in Halifax um, who comes to Boston with them, and but is quite ill. Um, but surprisingly, even while they're still camping on the green, one of the congregational churches allows them to baptize this child, even though um, they're not members of that congregation. Actually, even though it's quite a politically radical minister. Um, so they have some ill children. They show back up again in the medical records um, with smallpox. And Jane and one of her children go out to Rainsford Island, where they put the um, isolation hospital. Um, and the day that she is released to go home, there's also a little scrap of paper, a little receipt that was turned into the town selectmen from the town sexton that charged them for the burial of a soldier's child. So I think she loses one of her children there, I'm pretty positive, which when I found in the records, I, I actually did cry. Like, I, I become so attached to Jane. And um, so they, they leave their children, in fact, all in some ways all around the British Empire. They're buried in multiple places. Um, Matthew does live through this experience. He's sent back. He ends up with a small pension. Um, and so he, we know he makes it, um, but Jane does disappear from the records after she leaves with the regiment um, in um, the summer, she leaves in the summer of 29, so a few months after Matthew goes to back up. What can she say? I, I think I read somewhere that an incident leading up to what we're seeing here, um, the shooting. Yeah, yeah. Started with an argument between a wig maker yeah. and a British right. soldier over a dispute over a bill. A oh, dispute over a bill. So I. This is another one that I actually don't write about partly because I don't. Um, you know, the, the evidence on it is not fabulous, and I actually think there's another story here that I'm still trying to get at. But yes, the story is that shows up again in in those depositions, right? Um, is that a um, uh, is that a young man who is an apprentice to a wig maker um, accuses an officer walking by? Oh, you know, you haven't paid your bill, and the sentry says, 
don't talk to an officer like that, right? And then they get into it. Um, so that, and, and then the officer claims later, oh, I paid the bill, it was in my pocket. I mean, which is just a very strange thing to say, actually. Like, people, I don't know. It, um, officers tend not to be that worried about paying their bills, honestly. And the idea that, they, that the guy's carrying around his receipt has always seemed to me just deeply suspicious. But the other thing about this particular officer, um, that, which is a story I'm just trying to, still would love to figure out how to tell, he's in the 14th Regiment, he's not in the one that's involved in the shooting. So they stay in Boston for a couple of years. Um, and he is dismissed from his regiment with um, accusations of unnatural amours. Um, I know, which is a story I'm dying to figure out how to tell, right? And so there's a letter about this, and then he's, and there's some discussion about, well, are they going to let him leave quietly, or are they going to cashier him? And he ends up, to my great sorrow, riding to New York to have a face-to-face -face with the general about it, who took no notes. Right? Um, I was like, could you finish doing this by letter? Because this is more interesting. Um, but I actually am wondering if there is some piece of the story here, right, between this thing about the bill, the thing about his appearance, right, and the wigs, and, um, you know, the fact that he's booted out of the army, right, before they leave Boston. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out if there's any more strands to actually tell that story. But I felt it was unfair to the officer to just slander him as a guy who's kicked out for unnatural amours in print, but I don't totally know the whole story, so I left it out. So, um, I agree with the wonderful stories, and I really like the image that you have of uh, the shark that come out of it and at the end and go to various places. So I was wondering if you have um, trace any of those charts, because it would be amazing to hear about that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there's a few. I mean, some, um, you know, it's hard, of course, when they marry privates, the likelihood of finding them, finding the women in, um, in the records that are left is, are, the likelihood is slim, right? Um, so the men you can often trace through because they may get, you know, small pensions through um, the, um, uh, Chelsea Hospital, but um, but there are two families, um, one of whom actually is African descended, who end up buying land right around Surrey or something like that, and so they do show up in um, as as landowners eventually. Like they do settle as farmers and they get in um, in England, which is fabulous. And then for the more elites, right, those those show up more, and I've got more of that in. In the epilogue, I mean, and, and so one of the reasons I think of it as a sibling war is there are these two sisters who marry officers, right? One of whom marries um, uh, Henry Knox, who will become, of course, the um, Secretary of War, right, um, under Washington, and one of whom marries another one of these officers from the 14th Regiment named Erker, and they do write to each other, right? Um, and try to figure out what kinds of relationships they can have. Um, and in fact, the, the one who marries the um, officer um, ends up, which is surprising, getting a divorce, getting a Scottish divorce from him, um, in part because she's actually <coughs> accused also of starting her next marriage before she finishes the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's a lot of documentation actually about what happens to her, and we know a whole lot about her intimate life. Um, because apparently there are people who saw this um, and were willing to tell some Scottish court about it. Um, so, you know, those sisters, because they're illiterate, they do stay in touch, right? And one of them, the one who goes, you know, the one with the divorce, is still trying to get some of her father's patrimony, which is land in Maine, right? So she's still writing after the war to the Knoxes saying, come on, you guys still owe me something. You know, so, um, yeah, so some of those stay, right? They stay together. So you talk a lot about this us versus them dynamic that comes up and is especially clear in this uh, Revere piece. Um, do you, has any of your research focused on how that develops in terms of in 
as the, as, it, as the case goes to trial, because um, it seems like you tell this really intricate story about how they were so connected in the beginning, but then obviously so suppressed so quickly, and everybody got in line. All of the, I know there was competing pamphlets and all of this kind of stuff, but uh, surprised that these stories of how things were so connected and close or really were pushed away so quickly. Right, so there's a couple of things that happen back, right? One is that the evidence of their connection is like sort of unconsciously embedded in these pieces of testimony in these pamphlets, right? I mean, that's how I come across them, obviously. But, um, but it is true that as each side is trying to figure out how to position itself in terms of blame, because it becomes very, very quickly a blame game, right? Um, I mean, within hours. People are trying to figure out how are we going to come out looking okay. Officers are convinced their their careers are over, right? Um, and Bostonians are horrified. I mean, some of them see this as a moment to exploit, but most of them are just horrified, right? Um, so um, you know, so they start taking depositions immediately. But as I say, people keep marrying. That piece is all there. But when the stuff comes up in the um, trial. Right? They start telling these stories. They're trying to tell stories there about blame. Like that's the whole point of these trials, right? Is to figure out who's at fault, right? I mean, they're not trying to be historians. They're trying to be lawyers, right? And so the best example really is there's a woman who gives um, testimony in Captain Preston's trial. Um, she's she says she's come out from. She probably works at the Royal Exchange Tavern. She's stops to talk to the sentry. She's like, I hear noises, what's going on? And um, she claims she's on the street when the shooting happened. She has language, she strongly defends Preston. She says, I know he never said fire. I could see the you know, moonlight on his face. It was quite clear, his mouth never moved, right? Like really, really explicit. And um, the prosecution, and I told the story the other day to like the current um, Suffolk County DA and the three previous DAs before that, they were all horrified. Because the prosecution doesn't cross-examine her. But it turns out this woman, in the months between the time of the shooting and the time she gives her testimony, marries a soldier. Right? Like, she has become part of this community, at least in part. right? And the um, prosecution decides that they would rather actually let that piece of evidence, which otherwise they could easily kind of kicked out of the park, right? I'm like, we, this is a really biased piece of evidence. They do cross-examine other witnesses. They don't examine her, right? They would rather ignore that piece, right, than, um, than expose what those relationships were. Right? So, you know, just as one sort of one case, we can see how it falls apart. And then by, you know, the troops are still in Boston when Hancock gives his kind of famous oration. Um, and he says, you know, oh my gosh, you know, the evils of a standing army, they're going to like, you know, rape our daughters and, you know, our, rape our wives and seduce our daughters or something, as though He's not looking at an audience full of people who have just <laughs> intermarried, right? Um, and you know they're just saying this, right? It's uh, they're they're laying out a different story. Um, okay. Yeah, and they we need them to tell that story before we can get to a revolution. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much.